So I am very excited to get to introduce to you this evening, Rabbi Esther Letterman. Esther currently serves as the Director of Congregational Innovation at the Union for Reform Judaism. Prior to that role, she was the Associate Rabbi at Temple Micah in Washington, DC. Um, and she used her position in Washington, DC to really speak truth to power, to be at rallies, to be the rabbi um, who was the moral voice. She was ordained in 2008 from Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion in New York with me <laughs> prior to moving to Washington, DC. Rabbi Letterman was the Marshall T. Meyer Fellow at Congregation, Congregation B'nai Jeshurun in Manhattan. Uh, many of us have danced at BJ. Um, from 2010 to 2015, she led with Michelle Citrin, an extremely popular alternative high holiday experience for young and unaffiliated Jews in DC. And prior to becoming a rabbi, she worked several years in the non-for-profit world. She held positions with the Israel Policy Forum and directed a project on Middle East peace education for the URJ. Prior to that, she was the national director of Habonim Dror, North America. She has a BA in political science and Mid Middle Near Eastern studies from McGill University. She is very, very involved in the wider Jewish community, both at the national and local levels. She was, she was a recipient of award and currently sits on the board of TRUA, the Rabbinic Call for Human Rights. She chairs the Advocacy Council for Avodah in Washington and serves on the national board of AMENU, a national progressive Zionist organization. So Esther is from Ottawa, Canada. Originally, she now makes her home in Virginia with her husband and two children. And as I said, she was one of my classmates. And I don't know if my other rabbinic and uh, cantorial colleagues did this, but I would sit in New York and think, who would I want to be my cantor? Who would I want to be my rabbi? Sure. And I definitely wanted Esther to be my rabbi. And even though we don't work together, she certainly, certainly is. So it is my pleasure to have her share with us this evening. Mm. Thank you so much, Rabbi Greengrass. It is such an honor to be with at your community. It's such an honor to be invited in. Um, believe me, if I could have, I mean, if we were living in this world, I'd much rather get on an airplane and come down to Miami, Florida um, and be with all of you um, in Florida. But Zoom will have to do. Um, and I guess the benefit of Zoom is I don't have to get on an airplane. I can just come and be with you. So it is, um, it's a real, real honor to be with all of you uh, tonight. Um, so I prepared, um, Rachel, uh, Rabbi Greengrass explained that this was um, your Tikkun Olam Shabbat. I loved getting to see that slideshow. Um, and it's just an, it was an honor to be also here with Rabbi Barris, with Cantor Nelson, and the whole Beth Am team. Um, I feel more spiritually uplifted than I did, um, than I was, you know, 35 minutes ago. Um, I will admit I sent the kids somewhere else so they didn't have to make noise. Um, but it is, uh, you're bringing uh, true spirit into my, um, into my office, into my home here. So bless you for that. So let me begin with my prepared remarks. I remember being young, seven or eight. We were walking in the street, which I knew was unusual. It was windy and cold. And I have a memory of looking up and seeing all the adults standing tall around me. Then a woman gave me a squeeze and my mom said, that was the mayor who just hugged you. I guess that was a big deal. We were heading to our version of the Capitol building, the Canadian parliament. We were calling for an end to the nuclear arms race. I'm not even sure I knew how to pronounce the name nuclear at the time, but I knew it was about war and violence and destruction and a better tomorrow. And I knew that we were there to make our voices heard in more sophisticated language to take hold of our agency as citizens, as human beings and affect some sort of positive change for our country and the world. It was my first protest, but it would not be my last. At the time, I thought protesting was something my family did, the way other families went on ski vacations. Dinner table conversations were often filled with talk about the injustices in the world, apartheid in South Africa, famine in Ethiopia, the terrible injustices done to First Nation families in Canada. 
I did not yet have a sense that it was connected to Judaism. That would come much later. If someone had asked me what to find our family, I would have said justice, Judaism, and a lot of arguing, but I didn't yet know there was a deep connection between them. I don't remember anymore how old I was when I first encountered the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in the book of Genesis. I do remember learning about Lot's wife turning to a pillar of stone. In fact, on my first visit to the Dead Sea in the early 1980s, I remember trying to find her. But that was all I remember about the story from childhood. The part about Abraham's argument with God entered my life much later when I began to want to uncover for myself as an adult what riches lay in Jewish teachings. And that was really actually my entry to reform Judaism. Abraham's holy chutzpah, as I've come to consider it. Abraham, who had the audacity to argue, to protest against God. God, an eternal, all-powerful and all-knowing being. God, the creator of the universe. This is who Abraham had the audacity to argue with. When God declares that the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah will be destroyed, Abraham essentially says, hang on a minute, please. You're gonna destroy the entirety of these cities? You aren't even gonna try and save the innocent? I mean, you're the most powerful being in the whole world. So Abraham manages to convince God, if 50 innocent souls are found in the towns, they will be saved from destruction. And Abraham realizes, well, if God is up for some good old negotiation, let's see how far God will go. So Abraham continues, what's so special about 50? What about 40? Will you save the towns for the sake of 40 innocent people? And God agrees, for the sake of the 40, I will save the towns. And on it goes, Abraham pushing, agitating, protesting, until Abraham talks God down to 10. God will save the towns if 10 innocent souls can be saved. There we have it. The very first story of protest in our sacred text. Built into the DNA of the Jewish story. Built into the DNA of us as Jews. And it wasn't an aberration. The Torah continues to tell us story after story of protest, of dissent, of opposition of Moses, Miriam, and Aaron rising up against Pharaoh, of the midwives who ignored the dictates of their masters and saved Jewish children, of the daughters of Zelophehad who spoke out against the unfair rules about inheritance and managed to get a change, of prophets like Amos and Micah and Isaiah built into the DNA of the Jewish story. Now, many lifetimes later, I found myself in New York in a basement on West 4th Street, likely sitting near my friend and classmates, not quite yet Rabbi Rachel Greengrass, and the president of our seminary, Rabbi David Ellenson, pierced my soul with this text from Talmud. Anyone who is able to protest against the transgressions of one, one's household and does not is punished for the actions of the members of the household. Anyone who is able to protest against the transgressions of one's townspeople and does not is punished for the transgressions of the townspeople. Anyone who is able to protest against the transgressions of the entire world and does not is punished for the transgressions of the entire world. In other words, we are responsible for the actions of our fellow family members for our fellow neighbors, for our fellow citizens, for our fellow humans in the world. It was a moment when I realized protest wasn't just something my family did. It was something that was a part of who we were as Jews. It was a part of who I was as a Jew, and it was a part of who I was becoming as a Jewish leader. This classic Talmudic text, I would quickly come to realize this text is considered a top 10, was just one of hundreds of texts that address the question of rebuke. Now rebuke is a central commandment found in the book of Leviticus. The text reads, Pocheach tocheach et amecha. Surely you must rebuke your fellow friend. And the, the, the wording of the Hebrew, Pocheach tocheach, 
is a particular formulation in the Hebrew that really is repeating the verb and really trying to emphasize. Rebuke in modern English really means to tell somebody off. It's to call someone in or call someone out. It's to criticize someone for their behavior or their actions. And it is a critical component of Jewish life, but not for its own sake but as a way of offering a repair, a tikkun to the person and to the world. When we call someone out or we call someone in or we critique someone's behavior, it's not so we can be self-righteous. It's because we actually want them to change or we want the society to change or we want the context to change. And in fact, when the rabbis came to debate the meaning of the repetitiveness of this verb, right, the idea that it was tocheach, tocheach, the root has been repeated, they asked the question, well, why? This is strange. Why do you need to repeat it? And the rabbis came to interpret that to mean to say even 100 times, meaning if you have to rebuke or offer critique um, once, once is not enough because it's about getting the person or the society or the law to change. So you must do it. You must protest even a hundred times because it's not just about the critique. It's about changing the law, the policy, the position, someone's mind, someone's behavior, someone's attitude, someone's actions. And peaceful protest is one of the ways we offer our rebuke to elected officials, people in power, or to the society at large. It's a central component of a healthy and functioning democracy, and I would argue a central core concept of a living and embodied Judaism, a core part of our DNA as the Jewish people. To cut off our ability to protest is equivalent to sewing our lips shut. I share the following by Rabbi, um, sorry, not Rabbi, I share the following by Randy Weingarten, the president of the American Federation of Teachers a Jewish woman, she, she um, wrote in a speech, there is a saying from the Talmud, silence is akin to consent. The tragic culmination of so much violence against our brothers and sisters of color and against trans people is shocked and horrified us deeply. We cannot be silent. We must act and act not just in our own comfort zone, on the fights for economic and educational justice, but on fights for enduring racial justice as if our lives depend on it. We must not just change laws. We must fight to try to make Black Lives Matter in every classroom, on every street, and in every court in America. This is the moment to push for transformation in our country. This is the moment to start to transform ourselves, to transform our communities, and to transform our world. I wanted to share this quote of hers with you because the act of protest, the act of speaking out is really about transformation. As she said, it's about transforming who we are, transforming our communities and transforming our world. We aren't Jews for the sake of being Jews. We are Jews because as God said of Abraham, he will lead a people who will stand for justice and righteousness. And part of the way we stand for justice and righteousness is by speaking out and by choosing not to be silent. Sometimes our protests will fall on blocked ears and hardened hearts. We've encountered Pharaoh in the past and dare I say, we may again in the future. So although our goal is change, it is transformation, it is to move our society from brokenness to wholeness. Sometimes we must speak out, even if our words will not be heard. So I quote the words of Isaac Ben Moses Arama, a 16th century Spanish author of a compilation called Akeda Yitzchak, which means the sacrifice of Isaac. When an individual sins privately, if he's not going to listen, we do not rebuke him. However, this cannot be the case when an entire group or society commonly commits a transgression. They may even have reached the point where the mistake is so established that no one even bothers to point out that it is wrong. In that case, it is absolutely essential to mount a public protest, even if no one in power listens, but at least one does not allow a mitzvah of the Torah to be totally disregarded. 
It's been a long time since that cold fall day. The nuclear arms race between the US and the Soviet Union has been put to bed, even if the general concern about a nuclear bomb is still with us. But I still protest. Why? Because there are still broken parts that need fixing. Because it's in my DNA. Because it's in the DNA of the Jewish story. My seven and nine-year-olds have been to protests with me. I wonder what their memories will be of standing in front of the White House and the Supreme Court. And I hope they think this is what our family does. This is what the Jewish people do. Use our voices to change the world. So I wanna close by offering uh, a word about the person who invited me here tonight, Rabbi Rachel Greengrass who is a protester par excellence, who understands that this is what the Jewish people do, that the Jewish people use our voice to change the world. A person, a rabbi you have, who understands that silence is a form of consent, who understands what it means to rebuke for the purpose of change and transformation, and who also understands that it's not about her, that it's actually about the people that she leads, like all of the incredible leaders who are on this worship service tonight, and those who aren't on this worship service tonight who will be doing acts of loving kindness and acts of justice over this weekend and who did acts of loving kindness and acts of justice leading up to this. And I just wanna say uh, how much I am honored by uh, Rabbi Rachel Greengrass's uh, work in this world, how much she gives of her heart and soul to the community of Beth Am. And just I'll close by saying, um, you may not yet know this, um, but Rabbi Rachel Greengrass is being honored by um, an incredible organization for human rights called True Odd this May. Um, I'll put a little link in the chat um, and I'll just say that um, you are honored to have her as one of your rabbis, um, to have all your clergy really, um, that you also allow her to lead in this way and give you a model of somebody who says, um, we need to speak out, we need to speak out. So with that, I wish you a uh, Shabbat Shalom and a meaningful um, days of justice and acts of loving kindness.